Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, and this is part one of a three part series on the practical applications of precognition. With me is Marty Rosenblatt, a computational physicist who has had a long career working in military and industrial institutions. Marty is also the president of the Applied Precognition Project. Welcome, Marty. My pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you. Let's begin by talking about the history of applied precognition, and uh, we should mention that it is in the context of remote viewing and the work that was initially funded by the U.S. military industrial establishment or the military intelligence establishment that is the basis of your work. Uh, that's right. And the first paper, a very important paper, was published by Hal Pudoff and Russ Targ in the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. And they introduced the term remote viewing. They couldn't use words like psychic or clairvoyance, yeah. things like that. Never would have gotten the government funding. They were uh, physicists working, like you, a phys mm -hmm. working at SRI International, also known as the Stanford Research Institute, with funding from the CIA and other uh, military intelligence organizations. And the paper to which you're referring was published in the uh, Journal of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Correct. As I recall. Yeah. And at the time... It actually was controversial. Um, in fact, this field is still controversial, especially the precognition. Mm -hmm. But they did very pure scientific studies with um, remote viewing and one series of studies included precognition. Mm -hmm. um, would you like me to tell you a little bit about the, the well, let's studies? start with remote viewing. Let's okay. make sure that our viewers understand what we mean when we say remote viewing. Okay. In their study, which was classical remote viewing, they would have a viewer in a, on a, in a room in Stanford Research Institute, and Russ Targ was the monitor. Mm -hmm. He basically guided the person in terms of giving a description of a hidden. Now, it was hidden, obviously, to Russ as well as the remote viewer, right. so completely double blind. Mm -hmm. um, and the task of the remote viewer was to describe the site at which an outbounder person was going, and that site was chosen completely randomly. It was like a 20 to 30 minute drive from SRI. Yep. Um, and so the remote viewer's job was to describe that sight. And the reason there is a monitor in the shielded room with the viewer is just to help them relax, help them focus, ask pertinent questions from time to time. Now that's, that's exactly right. Uh, but the monitor, as you pointed out, is completely blind as to the actual target. Okay. So, so what you end off with after one of these, um, remote viewing sessions, is a transcript, mm -hmm. has maybe some sketches, some words, recording to what the person said, written down. Now it's given to a very important player here, which is an independent judge. The job of this judge is to now select, and typically they use nine different possible sites. Only one was the correct one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the judge is as blind as everybody else. In those experiments, the hit rate was phenomenal. Nearly 100%. Nearly 100%, and the odds against chance were calculated as one out of a million or mm -hmm. so. So that basically was a scientific demonstration of the um, ability of human consciousness to gather information at a distance. Yeah. And we might mention that uh, this research was funded for 20 years in a row by the uh, military intelligence agencies. Uh, every year, they'd send contract monitors out to SRI to see what's going on. That's right. And, of course, the applications were real. 
in those mm -hmm. days. In yep. fact, um, uh, very real. They were for example. Quite, well, they used remote viewers to gather information about the hostages during the Iran co um, contra um, uh, hostage, the Iranian hostage crisis. Yeah, and. Um, there was something going on in the Soviets where they were had high security. It was hidden. Yeah. They couldn't figure out what was going on in there. They asked Joe McMonagle, a army remote viewer, to do remote viewing on what was inside. He came up with transcripts that were describing a huge submarine, much huger than anything that existed mm -hmm. uh, prior to this, mm -hmm. um, drew sketches of it. And in fact, even came up with a launch date. Turns out at the time, the CIA really poo pooed it, said no way. Turns out that they mm -hmm. launched it within days of what he had yeah. predicted. And Joe McMonagall uh, received a Legion of Merit award from the Army for his service in the remote viewing program. Area for many yeah. other sessions that he did as well. Yeah, exactly over right. years. That's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And Joe still works in the field. He's retired from the military now for some time, but he works actively with researchers and, and others. So remote viewing is quite well established. At this point, many of our viewers may be skeptical, but there have been dozens of books written about it and many organizations working in this area, including the International Remote Viewing Association, where you are a regular presenter. Uh, yes, that's a very important um, organization, association, mm -hmm. um, because it brings together people from all over the world. And they can stay in contact, of course, over the internet. There are many groups doing remote viewing, um, which use that sort of as their connection mm -hmm. point. But now your special focus is precognition. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I love precognition mm -hmm. because it breaks the rules which most of science has accepted, mm -hmm. namely that cause has to precede the effect. Right. Well, precognition shows that information can effectively travel backwards in time. Which for some people is a total mystery because they would say the future hasn't happened yet. There is no future yet from which a, a signal could come. And guess what? Uh -huh. They're wrong. Uh -huh. Eventually, just like many other paradigms of the universe mm -hmm. we live in, yep. that's going to have to be given up. Well, it's mind-boggling because if the future has already happened, then what about free will? I've written a lot about that. <laughs> um, precognition in a society with free will. Mm -hmm. They are not contradictory, in my opinion. Yep. Because we are the creators of the future in this very now moment. This present moment is the only time we can do things. And it's influenced by the past. It's influenced by the future, which we help create. Mm -hmm. But our free will is in the now. Well, in part three of our three-part series, we'll go into some depth about your philosophy and the way people integrate these bizarre ideas psychologically. But for now, let's keep focusing on the history. Okay. Back to the SRI and that first um, uh, paper. Yeah. It turns out they got involved in precognition by accident. Mm -hmm. One of their viewers, um, Pat Price, mm -hmm. one of the best viewers, was doing a standard remote viewing session where he had to wait until the viewer, in fact, would get to the um, hidden site. Mm -hmm. Well, Pat said, I'm tired of waiting. I know where he is going to be. And the viewer and the person taking him there, which was Hal, hadn't been there yet. Russ, as a good monitor, said, okay, tell me what where mm -hmm. they're going to be. He wrote a session, one of the best sessions he's ever done, mm -hmm. and in fact, it was a total hit. Um, and that was an informal experiment. Yeah. After that, they did a whole formal mm -hmm. series, mm -hmm. which was reported in this paper. And, uh, of course, parapsychologists have been studying precognition for a long time, 
long before remote viewing ever appeared on the uh, map. Well, right. Precognition goes back. Hey, the oracles of Delphi mm -hmm. used it. Um, um, it's in the Bible all over the place, so uh, it's around. Yeah. Y yes, it is, but it's always been controversial, as you pointed out. Parapsychology itself, normal clairvoyance is controversial, Correct. precognition even more so. And you know what? That bothers me. Mm -hmm. You're bringing it up now. It bothers me because science has followed the classical scientific approach, which is duplication, mm -hmm. double-blind studies, yeah. having other people be able mm -hmm. to reproduce it. It's yeah. been reproduced many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. In fact, Princeton University reproduced the results of SRI, and yet most scientists will not accept precognition as there part of the universe. Dozens of published studies about remote viewing now and about precognition. Uh, I think what the reason that people are so resistant is isn't about the data at all, because as you point out, the data is there, but we have uh, very strongly imbued uh, philosophical beliefs in our culture. One of them is called naturalism. And according to the philosophy of naturalism, anything that reeks or smells of the supernatural is out of bounds. And they, people who are naturalists assume there can be no such thing as the supernatural. And precognition may have nothing whatsoever to do with the supernatural, but people suspect that it does. And so they, they figure it must be all uh, a mistake somewhere, error someplace. And that is the assumption, certainly, of most scientists. Yeah. I think in your normal population, I'm not sure that's true. Most people have had their deja vu experiences. Yeah. People have picked up the phone and know who are at the other end. Mm -hmm. So they just, they sort of know it's there. In fact, I think this is one of the most natural capabilities of human beings. Precognition could help you for avoiding uh, a lion that was around the corner yeah. during our early history as human beings. Mm -hmm. So it could be very well selected for. Mm -hmm. um, um, as an evolutionary trait. Exactly. Yeah. And there is no question that it exists, mm -hmm. and it's a natural capability. And hey... That is going to be something we're going to have to evolve into uh, as a society. Well, you've specialized in a particular research protocol called associative remote viewing, which really gets us to the heart of applied precognition. So let's describe how that works. Okay. Um, first of all, let me mention Stephen Schwartz's name. Yes. He was the fellow, as far as I know, who invented this, the first one to yes. use it. The basic idea is that you will remote something uh, um, that you'll see in the future, which is you will classical view a future target, which is classical precognitive remote viewing. So yes. you're going to remote a target in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, this, however, is associated. So this is where the word association comes from, with an event that might have multiple outcomes. Mm -hmm. We use it because it's the simplest with two possible outcomes. Sure. So let's consider a sporting event. Okay. Team A mm -hmm. and Team B mm -hmm. are the possible winners of some sporting event. Okay. So the remote viewer's task is to describe the photograph, we call it a photo site because the remote viewers can pick up sounds and smells and textures mm -hmm. that go along with the photo when it was taken. Okay. okay, so two possible outcomes, team A, team B. Let's say we as the tasker, okay, so we're setting this up, want um, photo site A, we associate that with the Eiffel Tower. We associate photo site B with a whale jumping out of the water. Those are the targets. Those are the two possible targets. Right. The actual target will be which one of these two occur. Mm -hmm. And that's the only target which the remote viewer will see. So wait, wait, let, let, let yes, me I review this sure. again because okay. I don't think it was it was clear. Okay. You've got two possible targets. One might be the Eiffel Tower. 
The other might be, uh, what did you say, a, a whale? A photograph of a whale jumping out okay. of the Okay, so they're water. very different exactly. from each other. If somebody is describing their mental imagery, it ought to be easy to say, does it more resemble the Eiffel Tower or a whale jumping out of the ocean? And the person is free to describe whatever mental imagery comes into their mind. Then these two possible targets are each arbitrarily designated by the researcher to be shown uh, at a designated point in time based on the outcome of, let's say, a sporting event. Exactly right. Okay, well mm -hmm. said. <laughs> um, now, so the remote viewer's tasking is really very simple. Mm -hmm. Describe and sketch the target, the photo you're going to see after the game. We're going to and show you this particular photo at a certain point in time. They don't even have no, to know about the, a game they, necessarily. They don't. Just describe and sketch the target you're going to see. Usually we associate a random coordinate with it mm -hmm. because people do a lot of these yeah. and it's like a folder number. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if the remote viewer says something like, Ooh, I sense water, I sense action, I sense an animal of some sort, and maybe that's all. Might mm -hmm. have some other things sketched and stuff like that. Now the judge comes into play. Yeah. You know, hey, in this case, it's pretty easy for mm -hmm. the judge to choose the whale mm -hmm. jumping out of the water, right. which is associated with Team B. Okay. So now the judge and the experimenter and are in the position to say, I believe, how did the remote viewer get that information? He must be getting it from when we show him at what's called feedback time, the whale picture. Uh -huh. And so we can actually wager. So now we have an application where you can wager before the sportings event on Team yeah. B. The key, I think, for some of our viewers to understand is that this association between the picture of the whale and Team B winning the sporting event is totally arbitrary. Correct. There's no meaning Correct. associated. Uh, and the reason that it's done is simply that a picture is an easier target than uh, the outcome of a sporting event. Uh, correct. And let's explain why that's so. Okay, there's this concept of fixed choice, mm -hmm. okay, where there's, um, will it be team A, will it be team B, right. heads or tails? Yeah. After a while, A, that gets very boring, mm -hmm. B, the intellect will get involved. If I have three heads in a row, somehow it's going to think the next one must be a tail, right. when in fact, You want to that's keep not the, the intellect case. out of the way when you're doing remote viewing. That's right. Or any kind of psychic work. It's clear that the intellect does just that. It adds mm -hmm. noise. Mm -hmm. And um, so you want to, and the remote viewers all know this. Mm -hmm. uh, so they try to get very quiet. Plus, it's a lot more fun to get these kind of pictures. You try to keep the pictures interesting. Mm -hmm. And let me just make another comment on the randomness. This is all done by computer. Um, most people who do this kind of work, and mm -hmm. in our case, we have 800 prepared pairs of photos, uh -huh. like the Eiffel Tower. So, yeah. very different. Yeah. However, it is randomly chosen with A versus B, plus the pairs randomly chosen. Mm -hmm. Nobody other than a computer actually knows which pictures are going to be associated. So, it isn't a kind of telepathy where the viewer can get it from somebody who selected the pictures. Yeah. So, the idea is if, if the viewer describes one of the targets in the pair accurately, you would then have the confidence to place a wager or an investment or a, a speculation on the outcome. That's exactly right. That's the whole idea. And the fact of the matter is, it's not 100%. Mm -hmm. The viewers sometimes give um, inaccurate ones, sure. give some that's close, and the judge has to make a tough call. Um, but it's far over chance. That's the key. It reminds me a lot, Marty, of baseball players. Like Babe Ruth was one of the greatest home run hitters who ever lived. Uh, we remember him. But 
what people don't remember is that he struck out far more often than he right. hit a home run. And right. I think good psychics, really good psychics, are often like that. They're statistically successful, but not necessarily to the point where some people think, you know, they should be hitting a home run every time they step to the plate. It doesn't work that way. That's exactly right. And mm -hmm. that's important for kind of society to get. Yeah. All of us are going to have to learn how to live with this level of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, maybe someday it'll be up to 99%. But I doubt it will ever be up to 100%. And um, I would say currently, if I, mm -hmm. I say the hit rate of most of the viewers that have been around for a while, between 60 and 70%. Mm -hmm. Well, there have been a number of published studies where people have used the associative remote viewing protocol to successfully uh, invest. Uh, one of the first, I think, was published by Hal Putoff back in the 1970s. Uh, yeah, he did this for a school that mm -hmm. one of his kids was involved That's in. That's right, a Waldorf school. He wanted to raise about $30,000, and yep. they did 10 yeah. trials investing in the futures market uh, quite successfully, and, and he achieved his goal, so he stopped. Okay, now, long after that, mm -hmm. though I don't know how many years exactly, but a few years after that, Russell Targ yep. did a study with um, Karif... Keith Karari. Keith, Keith, Keith Karari was the viewer. In the Silvers market, yes. and they got nine straight hits, and they had an investor working with them. Mm -hmm. Apparently, an investor made a fair amount of money, mm -hmm. so that's rather... Amazing. Nine hits in a row has odds of like one out of 500, 512. Mm. Um, however, this shows one of the things with precognition, which is rather important. They then did another series and they were all misses. Yeah. And this shows how psychology is so important. Not only did the investor apply more pressure, got them to do two predictions a week rather than one. So he was obviously over anxious, added to mm -hmm. the stress level. Yeah. Um, and I think the viewer and the judge had more stress because they'd been so successful. I interviewed Keith Harari uh, many years ago about this episode, and he said that he began to feel like the goose that laid the golden egg after nine hits in a row and uh, uh, profits of well over $100,000 at, at that point uh, many years ago when that uh, was worth even more than it would be today, much more right. than it would be today. So uh, there is a psychological factor uh, when you're dealing with money. When you're successful, it goes to your head. And when you're unsuccessful, it can become uh, frightening. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Joe McMonagle summarized it, I think, very well. He basically said, it's all psychological. Mm -hmm. Where is this information coming from? It's coming from deep into what we call the psyche. Yep. Your subconscious. There's mm -hmm. something inside you that is connected to virtually everything in space and time. Mm -hmm. And how does that get up from inside there, down there? Um to your consciousness. To the point where you can create a transcript right. that describes very specific information. It's a, it's a mystery how people can narrow in on it. You give them a, a, a six-digit number to designate the target. Well, uh, because there could be a zillion targets, right. but they seem to be able to, statistically speaking, hone in on yep. that, that mysterious target. And the psychology of the person mm -hmm. becomes very important. And we see that in the transcripts that we see, and everybody else that does this has seen it too. Yeah. Sometimes the information is very metaphorical. Sometimes the information is related to things that is personal to them mm -hmm. that connects to the target. Yep. Um, in fact, one case came to mind, which was kind of amazing to me, which was a viewer avoided um, a pool, a wonderful picture of a kid underwater in a pool, and he described the other possible 
target. Yes, which is called displacement. Exactly. Yes. He got displacement. and An accurate description of the of wrong, the wrong target. target. Yeah. And usually I don't show the viewers. I don't like to encourage that mm -hmm. because they say, see, I'm a good psychic. I'm a good remote view, even though it's the wrong one. Yeah. I only want them to get the right one. But in this case, I showed him that. And he said, oh, my God, of course I wouldn't do that one. I almost drowned in a pool. Uh-huh. So, so the, his mm -hmm. psychology mm -hmm. avoided going into that. Well, there's so many ways in which uh, an applied precognition project can go wrong. It's amazing that that you get a statistically significant result, which I know you have. You've been working steadily, slowly, carefully on, on this work with a single-minded focus for well over a decade now. Well, that's true, um, and I'm enjoying it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's right at the cutting edge yeah. of science. And we're, we're going to focus specifically on your research in part two right. of our series. But a lot of other people have been doing this as well. In mm -hmm. fact, I want to mention Ed May. He's mm -hmm. the other one that has done an awful lot of associative remote viewing as well as regular remote viewing. Yes. Um, and he's continuing to this day to do experiments. Mm -hmm. um, so He was uh, at one time the head of the uh, research program funded by the military intelligence exactly, community. Exactly. Yeah. He moved on to SAIC from SRI. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so he is doing... Um, to this day, this yeah. this kind of work. Well, Marty, we're running out of time okay. at this point, but thank you so much for sharing this half hour with me. It went fast, and thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> and thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your listings for part two of our three-part series on the practical applications of precognition.